Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is John Panetti. I am with ICF and I will be uh, your host today. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to Onye to kick off the webinar. Thank you, John. Um, welcome everybody and thanks for joining this webinar today. We're going to be talking about the recent guidance around the flexible match concept released by both FEMA and HUD um, back in October. We will start with an overview of FEMA and HUD, and then we'll go into detail on how to conduct flexible match with examples, how to satisfy federal requirements applicable to both FEMA and HUD, and how flexible match can provide both an added benefit to FEMA applicants and HUD grantees. So to introduce everyone who's involved with this presentation, we have Jane Carpenter, the Assistant Director of Policy for the Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division at HUD. We have Carrie Whitehead, the Attorney Advisor working on Affordable Housing and Community Development, Disaster Recovery, Resilience, and Economic Development at HUD. And Michaela Catani, um, the Community Development and Planning Specialist at HUD. We also have a few folks from FEMA, uh, Denise Yandel, the Public Assistance Branch Chief for Region 10, and Sarah Mulligan, the Supervisory Emergency Management Specialist at FEMA. And lastly, we have myself, Oni Ibe, uh, from ICF. So just to get started, we're gonna go over at a high level um, the, different, the differences between FEMA and HUD and what they do. Uh, FEMA and HUD oversee two separate grant programs. Each grant is distinct in how it is awarded who and what is eligible to receive the funding and what requirements the grants must adhere to. FEMA is the federal awarding agency authorized to manage the public assistance or PA program. FEMA PA applicants are entities that apply for PA funding and are responsible for carrying out a project. PA re recipients are entities who receive the award from FEMA directly and PA subrecipients receive the subaward from the PA recipient. FEMA works with the recipient and subrecipient throughout the recovery process. The Stafford Act, which governs this whole process, encourages both states and localities to develop comprehensive disaster preparedness plans and prepare for better intergovernmental coordination in the face of a disaster. The law also provides federal assistance programs for losses due to a disaster and encourages the use of insurance coverage after receiving assistance. The funding assistance provided through FEMA's PA program is subject to the local match requirements in that the federal share cannot be less than 75% of the eligible costs. This rule is what allows for other sources of funding that we're going to talk about, like CDBGDR, to come into play and fund the 25% that would otherwise not be covered by FEMA. On the other side, we have HUD who is authorized to allocate and award the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Funding, or CDBGDR, when Congress makes funds available. CDBGDR funds are provided as a block grant to grantees who have the primary responsibility to oversee and administer this funding. As per regulations, grantees can actually use CDBGDR funds for payment of the non-federal share that is needed for, to satisfy local match. This means that CDBGDR grantees can use grant funds to satisfy the local match for FEMA PA programs if the use meets all CDBGDR requirements. The share would be up to 25%, but also be aware that for certain disasters, you wanna keep in mind that circumstances can change such that maybe the federal obligations could be increased. So FEMA covers more, which means that the so the local match requirement is less. So let's get into public assistance. Um, FEMA's public assistance is the largest grant program and provides funds to communities responding to and recovering from major disasters. After a disaster, FEMA informs PA applicants of new funding and they have 30 days to submit their request for public assistance. The PA recipient or the subrecipient will then prepare PWs or project worksheets for eligible work based on actual 
or estimated costs. The project worksheet is a tool used by the PA applicant and FEMA to develop projects and is the primary document used to specify the location, the damage, the scope of work, and the cost estimate for each project. FEMA processes all PA grant funding through these project worksheets. The PA program also determines the eligibility of any project by first evaluating the applicant, facility, work, and cost in that order, such that eligible applicants can include states, federally recognized tribal uh, governments, U.S. territories, local governments, and certain private nonprofit organizations. Eligible facilities must have been impacted by a presidentially declared incident, be located within the disaster designated area, and be the legal responsibility of an eligible applicant. Eligible work for the PA program consists of emergency work under Section 403 and Section 407, and permanent work under Section 406. Eligible costs must tie back to eligible work, be necessary and reasonable, be documented, be reduced by all applicable credits like insurance, and be consistent with the applicant's internal policies. So when formulating projects, FEMA distinguishes between what are small and large projects. Project total costs falling below the large project threshold are small projects. The minimum project threshold and large project threshold are adjusted annually for inflation. For disasters declared or to be declared in FY21, the project minimum is 3,320 and the large project cost has costs equal to or greater than $132,800. Funding for small projects are usually based on estimates while large projects are based on actual costs documented. However, most large projects are initially approved based on estimated costs because work is not completed at the time of approval. When it comes to formulating these projects, PWs um, should be grouped in a logical manner to include multiple facilities and or sites into one project. To group similar types of work in a single PW or project, you want to make sure that the work aligns with one of FEMA's categories of work. So as you can see here, we have section 403 and 407 that cover emergency preparedness and response and debris removal respectively. We also have section 406 that covers what we would call permanent work or um, categories C through G, uh, such that the work can be for roads, bridges, um, water facilities, and so forth. Then you have section 422, which covers anything that cuts across these prior sections but are considered small projects. So they're below that minimum threshold we just discussed. And then lastly, we have Section 428, which cover the alternative procedures projects. When formulating projects, you also want to consider the following. Is the work going to be awarded under a single contract or multiple contracts? Is the damage contained in or around the same facility or system? And is the damage within a site-specific area or boundaries? These type of questions and considerations really help you understand what type of work you're combining and make sure that you're grouping things in a logical manner um, that makes it easier down the road for local match uh, to be conducted. The more logical your projects are, the easier your review is, should be, and the easier it will be for you to reimburse the costs later on. So now we'll talk about HUD's grant. After a disaster, Congress may appropriate funding for CDBGDR grants to address disaster recovery needs that are not met by other sources of federal disaster assistance. With funding available, HUD provides CDBGDR grants to states, local governments, or tribes. Before receiving a grant, CDBGDR grantees must develop and submit to HUD an action plan for disaster recovery that describes how they intend to use the CDBGDR funds including any funds designated by the grantee for activities that will satisfy PA local match requirements. If not included, adding local match as, an, as, a, as a new activity later will be considered a substantial amendment to the original plan, which will require additional citizen participation and another set of HUD approvals. To use CDBGDR funds, programs and activities must have a direct tie back to the disaster 
and prioritize benefit to low and moderate income persons or households. CDBGDR funds can be used across 26 eligible activities, which can be grouped into housing, economic development, infrastructure, planning, and administrative related types of work. Through waivers and alternative requirements, HUD may authorize additional activities. So you wanna be aware of that. And also when you're talking about what is eligible, you, know, you should also be thinking about what is ineligible. In that, ineligible activities are anything that are not specifically authorized. So examples can include um, maintenance and operations, general cost of government, purchase of equipment or personal property, um, and things like that. Um, just be aware, however, that in some, in some situations, costs that are presumed to be ineligible can actually be eligible. So it is recommended that you work with HUD to sort out issues that may arise for specific activities during the grant life cycle. So as I stated, to satisfy the requirements for CDBGDR funding, activities must meet a CDBGDR national objective by benefiting LMI persons. Addressing an urgent need because existing conditions pose an immediate threat to the community or by preventing or eliminating slum blight situations. The term LMI is defined as persons of low and moderate income, meaning members of families or households whose incomes do not exceed 80% of the medium income of the area involved. LMI person can include one person families and LMI households includes all persons occupying a housing unit. The requirement depends on the applicable Federal Register notice, but generally to carry out this objective, not less than 70% of the overall CDBGDR grant must be used for activities that benefit LMI persons. On the FEMA side, the number and scope of PA projects and facilities is determined by PA program requirements without regard to LMI benefit. So it's important that CDBGDR grantees be diligent about how they use their CDBGDR funding to satisfy PA local match and the ability to satisfy their own LMI benefit requirement. When trying to satisfy the local match requirement, CDBGDR grantees and their subrecipients should prioritize use of LMI benefit national objective criteria and be diligent in documenting their compliance with that requirement. Another requirement to be aware of is the most impacted and distressed areas or MID. CDBGDR appropriation acts typically require that all funds benefit the most impacted and distressed areas resulting from a disaster. The mid areas can be designated by both HUD and the CDBGDR grantee. An activity may take place outside of a mid area if the activity is necessary to address a recovery need within a mid area. Typically 80% of the CDBGDR grant must address unmet disaster needs within the HUD identified mids. The grantee may determine where to use the remaining 20% of the allocation, but that portion of the allocation may only be used to address needs in areas that the grantee determine are most impacted from the same disaster. As per the guidance, PA projects cannot use DR funding as a source for the local match if the location is outside the HUD or CDBGDR grantee identified area. Um, so we've gone through some of the big overviews of FEMA and HUD. These are things to keep in mind as we get deeper into discussing flexible match. And with that, I'll turn over the presentation to Sarah to discuss uh, flexible match. Excellent, thank you so much. So my name is Sarah Mulligan. Uh, as was stated earlier, I work for public assistance um, in our policy shop. So I'm going to um, continue by talking about um, the kind of the flexible match concept and how what this uh, means for HUD grantees and FEMA recipients and subrecipients. So on January 3rd of this year, FEMA and HUD both signed a joint memorandum of understanding. And one of the outcomes of that was to develop an implementation guidance for defining what we were thinking of as flexible match. And this is something that the two grant programs have done in the past, um, but have never really uh, formalize it. So this, this memorandum of understanding was uh, an attempt to do so, and then the subsequent implementation guidance was to kind of lay out the steps in a little bit more finer detail on what that meant for our grant programs. 
So FEMA published the implementation guidance and put it, it's on the FEMA website. HUD issued it through a CPD notice that is similarly on the HUD exchange. And so these same guidance can be found both places and we kind of just sort of blast them out to our own communities. Um, but the guidance documents are the same and have been agreed upon by both agencies. So um, just to kind of back up a little bit for folks on the line that might not be as familiar with um, the public assistance program, one of the kind of key elements of public assistance and FEMA overall is that it's really a partnership between uh, the federal government, FEMA, um, our states and our applicants, typically like uh, was described above, local governments, um, uh, tribal governments, territorial governments, uh, and some private nonprofits. So it's really, it's really a partnership. And as part of that partnership, all of our FEMA-funded um, public assistance projects are subject to what we call a cost share. And so the federal government typically pays 75% of a project cost. So if a school is damaged, that um, the repair or restoration of the, of the disaster damage, 75% is paid by FEMA, and then 25% is paid, 25 sorry, is paid by the local government or sometimes local governments and states will have a partnership to kind of pay for that local cost share. Now that those um, proportions do change um, depending on the kind of scale and magnitude of a disaster. And so sometimes you may see it go up to 90% as the federal government and 10% as the applicant, but everything is, is subject to a cost share. And the purpose of that is really to um, make sure that both parties, because it is a partnership, have some sort of stake um, and some skin in the game. And so it kind of it helps us kind of create that, um, that cohesion in the partnership in um, uh, the disaster recovery framework. So what this guidance does is it presents a, a streamlined process for applying um, a flexible match. And that is when uh, the local government will decide to use their HUD CDBGDR money if, if allocated, if they have it and it's, it's allowed for that purpose, but they can use some of that money to um, for all or, um, or a portion of their local cost share. And so the guidance document kind of explains what that looks like, presents a streamlined process. The way that we've been doing this, and, and this has been done in the past in numerous disasters, but this is kind of we've worked closely, FEMA and HUD together to kind of see how we could do it in a more streamlined approach that um, reduces administrative burden on um, grantees, subgrantees, our applicants, and the government overall. Um, it presents the requirements of both agencies because um, as I'm sure anyone who's dealt in the federal grant world knows, uh, each agency has their own specific uh, criteria that have to be met in order to receive grant dollars. And so the guidance document also tries to articulate what those are at a high level just to kind of have a, a one-stop shop for that. Um, and then it presents a couple of different planning tools that. Uh, um, are available for uh, FEMA applicants and, and HUD grantees to use when kind of anticipating the use in the future, or if you know newly um, a new disaster, kind of where where to go to start kind of planning and, and theorizing how this is going to work for um, for you. And then this guidance really applies across the board. It is to help will help FEMA and HUD staff, but also HUD grantees and sub grantees and um, FEMA applicants. Those are um, you know, we refer to them as recipients and subrecipients, but just those who are receiving um, our funding. So um, to kind of go a little bit more into um, what this is, and we talked about this at the beginning of the project and kind of that um, project formula, I'm sorry, in the beginning of the presentation to talk about the project formulation that HUD or that FEMA undergoes, but a FEMA project, so our project worksheet would um, a lot of times contain multiple multiple sites, and that's, um, you know, things that are going to be procured together or um, activities that have some sort of commonality. Um, we usually encourage applicants to put those all in one project worksheet. So kind of an easy example I like to think about are, are, are buildings because they're kind of discrete, discrete facilities or sites, but a uh, community that is, um, uh, might decide to put all of their schools, all, all of the schools that were damaged in that disaster onto one project worksheet because they're going to procure the work to fix those schools together or the schools have, you know, their, their buildings are subject to the same type of building code. So, you know, it, it's easier to kind of um, organize their grant that way. And so with having the um, traditional way in which the funding is applied, then each of those kind of discrete sites has 75% or FEMA and then 25% local. And then that kind of is, is 
distribute across the board. And when we're just talking local funds and FEMA funds, it's, it's pretty straightforward because um, we're just dealing with one federal agency. But when the local government will use HUD funding, it gets a little bit more complicated because now each of those schools within this one project worksheet is subject to both FEMA and HUD requirements. And so what the flexible match concept does, and I'm going to jump ahead in, in the slide just a bit because I think this graphic sort of illustrates this, is now, you know, if you have four schools, the local government can say, you know, we're only going to apply our HUD funding to this one school. And so only that one school needs to have both FEMA and HUD compliance requirements. And then the rest of the schools that uh, constitute like 75 percent of the rest of the grant only really need to deal with the FEMA requirement. And so HUD, HUD, they can consolidate HUD funding on discrete sites or facilities within a FEMA project worksheet. And then only those that have both governmental, both federal agency funding um, going to do work will be required to follow both um, compliance requirements. And so that is hopefully going to streamline and simplify things kind of across the board. Um, and so they are, uh, applicants or HUD grantees can consolidate their funds and kind of decide which, you know, discrete points to, to, choose, to apply that funding. Um, all sites will be required to comply with PA funding. It's just those that have the HUD funding, too, will also have to have HUD. Um, so FEMA, FEMA rules will apply to everything on a FEMA grant. HUD funding cannot pay for FEMA eligible costs, so it's only going to be eligible for whatever that local cost share is. So if FEMA can pay for it, FEMA will have to pay for it um, up to, you know, what our eligibility is, and then the local share will be um, uh, can be a combination of HUD and local funding um, or all HUD funding. Just that is really a, a decision that can be made at the local level. With that, I will pass it over to Denise Yandel, also with FEMA headquarters, to kind of go through a little bit more of uh, how that breakdown would look. Great. Um, as Sarah showed um, in this particular illustration, and I'm going to go in the next couple of slides into a little um, more level of granularity, how it works is, uh, as she noted, the first we have a normal, or we call it a traditional process, and then we have the flex match process. So if we kind of follow, the next slide is going to show us how the traditional process works. Um, under the tr traditional concept, the CDBG DR funds apply at a local match at the entire project. As seen in this slide, each cost and uh, site is proportionally distributed between the PA and CDBGDR money. Um, this means that all work is subject to both PA and CDBGDR eligibility and compliance requirements. So as you notice in site number one, two, three, and four, um, the HUD funding is distributed 25% uh, to each of the sites for a grant total of $287 thousand five hundred dollars. What this means is that each site has to meet HUD's requirements. Each site has to meet PA FEMA requirements when it comes to doing the compliance. Um, but uh, what I want to show on the next slide is how the two hundred eighty seven thousand dollars is used when it comes to the flexible match. So let's move to the next slide. In the flexible match, and um, uh, you you're using the concept where the applicant can pick and choose which project they want to apply their CDBGDR funding. It can either be to a specific facility or to a specific site within that project. Now, be mindful, all sites and facilities must comply with FEMA PA requirements. However, only the site that's using the CDBGDR assisted portion must comply with the CDBGDR requirements. So the flexible match concept can reduce the number of facilities and sites within the project that must comply with both federal reg, um, grant requirements. So if you notice in this particular example, which is the exact same as the previous example, except we're taking uh, site number four, and site number four is going to um, comply or has to comply with all of HUD's requirements. Um, but you also have to be mindful that all sites, sites one through four, still have to comply with all of FEMA's PA requirements. So let me turn it over to Jennifer Carpenter with HUD, and she's going to go into some factors to consider when selecting a site or facility to use the CBDG funding. All right. Thanks, Denise. 
as uh, Denise mentioned, I'm going to just really walk through an example. This example is also in the guidance um, in greater detail even than we'll talk about today, so definitely reference that later. Um, but in the example we're going to talk about, we made the numbers pretty easy to walk through this. So the PA applicant received FEMA approval for a $1 million FEMA PA scope of work. The FEMA PW approved under Section 406 includes five local road segments with 40 sites. These sites had flood damage that caused washouts. Uh, washout, those who are not uh, familiar with them are where the roadbed is eroded away by flowing water that's usually caused by a flood. Um, in this case, uh, the FEMA, uh, the PA applicant has to provide a 25% local match for the PW. So it's a million dollar project that puts their match at 250,000. That means their FEMA PA federal cost share will be 750,000. Uh, the DR subrecipient consults with the grantee and determines that based on the locations of road segments one and two, which you see circled on the slide, um, those specific road segments could meet the DR national objective criteria for area benefit to uh, low and moderate income persons. So that means that those two road segments are in primarily residential areas where at least 51% of the residents benefiting are persons of low and moderate income. So that makes it a pretty easy decision on where the DR funds will go and what they'll pay for um, because that allows you to meet that national objective, which is such a huge part of the DR requirement. So the subrecipient decides they're going to set aside the $250,000 of the DR funds to meet the match requirement, and they'll apply those funds to those two road segments and be able to meet a low mod, a low and moderate income national objective. So in this example, the PA applicant determined that grouping the road projects into a single FEMA PA PW is logical because the projects are similar, right? They're all road projects. By using a flexible match, the DR grantee can consolidate the DR funds into as few sites as possible, and then you only have to review the relevant portions of the PW that are considered DR assisted. It reduces the administrative burden on the grantee. This obviously allows the potential local match to be greater on a single PW and also allows the review by the DR grantee to be much simpler as they can fund more of the project without having to make every eligible site, every site eligible. So we're going to dig even deeper, right? And we're going to look at what am I actually paying for with the DR funds? Because um, obviously that's really important. We have all these, these additional requirements on the DR funds. And, and it matters what you're paying for and when. So in this case, in this example, um, HUD is going to pay for the planning and design costs for road segments one and two, and then the reconstruction of all the washout for road segment one, and then a portion of the reconstruction um, of the washout for road segment two. So we didn't want to give you a perfectly clean example. We wanted to focus on how these nuances in a project, like just paying for a portion of the construction work, would affect these requirements. So that's why we did it this way. Um, and al although the DR funds are not used to pay for the entire cost of road segment two, right, we're saying we're just going to cover 50000 of the construction costs for road segment two, um, it still means it's we still have to think about the entire road segment, too, when we're talking about um, meeting a national objective, right? So reconstruction um, of road segment, two is an eligible CDBG activity, so you can check that box even if you're just paying for a portion. But the entire work under road segment, two has to be completed to meet the low mod income national objective that we talked about earlier on area basis. Um, so that has to be complete or the folks in the area aren't benefiting, right? So to meet that national objective, even though you're only paying for a portion, the entire road segment uh, has to be completed to meet that national objective. The other thing we want to talk about is understanding the contract structure. Um, we are probably going to talk, we're going to talk a lot about procurement 
Um, I'll even talk about on the next slide as well. So you're going to get a lot of procurement, but it's really one of those things that you really want to think about before you, um, if, if you can do it prior to uh, procuring for these services, if you can think about where the DR funds, what they're going to pay for, when they're going to pay for it. Um, it's just, you really want to think about these things as early as possible and work with the folks on the other side of the house who are doing this, um, make sure those requirements are in there. Um, in this case, if the procurement is already completed um, and the contract does not require the contractor to comply with CR requirements, you're going to have to work with both parties to amend that contract. You have to have those DR requirements in the contract or you're going to have to do a new procurement to include them. So it's really something that's really important. Hopefully, if you've already done the procurement, the other party will work with you to add those additional requirements in. But if not, you will have to re-procure for those services to make sure you're not in noncompliance. You also want to understand how Davis-Bacon wage rates and Section 3 requirements would apply to the entirety of the project assisted with DR funds, so not just the portion you're paying for um, in road segment two, but the entire project. You need to examine each of these requirements separately because they do all apply a little bit differently. I mean, generally speaking, CDBG requirements apply to the CDBG assisted portion of the project, but there may be some requirements that don't work that way. And so you want to make sure you're looking at each one. So for example, you have um, Davis-Bacon wage rates that would apply to all of segments one and two. Uh, even though DR funds will not be used to pay for all of the work in segment two. So that's one where, you know, a dollar of the DR funds in that project will trigger those requirements. So even though you're not paying for the whole thing, you still want to make sure you're following Davis-Bacon wage rates. Um, also, environmental requirements that would apply to the whole project. And then when you're dealing with procurement, it is a little bit different, right, because you can procure for the services separately. So if we change this example and said FEMA is actually going to pay for the planning, design, and permitting of road segment two, and then the DR funds are only going to be used for the construction, the FEMA work could be procured separately, and then it wouldn't be subject to the CDBG, D, um, the CDBG procurement requirements, right? Because it was procured separately, it's being paid for by FEMA. But we just need to know, right? You need to know what you're paying for and, and when you're paying for it so you can make sure those, those correct requirements are in there when you're dealing with procurement specifically depending on the entity, right? If you're a CDBG, DR, state grantee, um, there are some differences on procurement that we that we know about. If, and, and if you're a local government, there are some differences between states and local governments. So you just want to make sure that you're following the correct procurement requirements for the activities that you're paying for. Once you get these items worked out, you can begin using DR funds for the local match. So let's talk about pitfalls. Again, um, some of these I just talked about like procurement, but let, let's dive into them a little bit. Um, one is you want to avoid paying for more than the local match. Um, so avoid paying for PA eligible costs in excess of the final amount of the local match requirement. You can do this by making sure you're tracking local match payments to actual costs rather than estimates. So this is really important for pre PWs where FEMA may reduce the PW obligation from its original estimate to match the final actual cost. So make sure that your local match um, is matching the actual cost of the project. The second one, DR funded work meets HUD and FEMA requirements. We've been saying this over and over since we started the presentation. Um, you just, we just can't reiterate it enough. You just always want to make sure that you're meeting the requirements of both programs. Adhering to FEMA requirements is not enough. If you're using DR for match, it could potentially disallow costs if certain applicable regulations are not followed. You don't want that to happen. Um, the third one, procurement. Not understanding how the match could affect your procurement. So just walking through this example again, because I know it's confusing. Um, you can have projects 
where one or more of the contracts are procured separately. The written scope of work and how those contracts were procured will influence what regulation the contract needs to follow and the ability to be able to re reimburse those costs with DR funding. If any part of a contract is funded with DR, then it must comply with both FEMA and HUD applicable regulations. If a contract is not funded with DR, but the scope of the contract includes work on the DR-assisted portion of the project, then even though the procurement doesn't have to follow DR procurement requirements, the contractor must be required to carry out the contract scope of work in compliance with both FEMA and HUD applicable regulations. So let's just walk through this again. I want to just make sure folks understand this. If you have procured four services and part of those services will be paid for with DR funds, you want to make sure that contract includes everything you need in it for the DR funds, or you will have to amend that contract or re-procure if both parties will not agree to amend. So it's much easier to make sure those DR requirements are in there ahead of time and will save you a lot of time and grief in trying to amend those contracts. And lastly, we want to encourage folks to think about timing considerations. DR grantees and HUD fully expect DR grantees to set aside DR funds to pay local match um, on projects that are still in the development phase and where costs have yet to be incurred. But Remember that DR has a time limit. You have an expenditure deadline on those funds. So waiting to expend the DR funds for PA local match could jeopardize the funding um, if you're not able to spend the funds within the correct period of performance. So this is why grantees and PA applicants need to coordinate early on to ensure that the project start and end dates are defined and that a project spend schedule can be allowed in order to ensure timely expenditure of DR funds because it's really about spending the money on the DR side. That's where your requirement is, whether it's six years for a regular DR program, whether it's 12 years for our mitigation funds, whatever the timeline is on spending your money on the, on the HUD side, that's about spending the money. You don't have to meet a national objective. That's not what it's about. That's not what the requirement is. The requirement is about spending the money. And then obviously you will ultimately have to meet a national objective to make that eligible. Um, but just remember that when you're working with your partners and, and talking about timelines. All right, I am now going to turn it over to Carrie. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, we're gonna go over a couple of things in the next couple of slides that are really the, you know, kind of some big picture questions that um, we, we know will affect your overall compliance and things that you're gonna wanna do to just make sure that your use of flexible match is successful as possible. So, both Sarah and Denise touched on this, this graphic, right? The normal process versus the flexible match process. And I think that um, because flexible match is so new as a, as a concept, the key here to successful implementation of the concept is constant communication between your departments that are carrying out um, your public assistance grants and your CDBGDR grants. So, it, um, you know, there are all kinds of things that change over the course of recovery. And that's true for public assistance and for CDBGDR. But for your public assistance projects, your scope of work can change, your costs can increase and decrease. You can have project delays caused by any number of things. And the project delays can either cause the deadline for the completion of your public assistance work to fall after your deadline for um, your period of performance for your CDBG disaster recovery grant or vice versa. So uh, in order to make sure that as the uses of the two funds come together, 
there's compliance on, for, you know, with both program requirements, both sets of program requirements, you really need to have a, a point person for each type of assistance that is in constant coordination, and this hinges on project management. I think you're going you're gonna to hear that a couple of times today. We've already heard it a couple of times that applying flexible match requires more coordination um, between the PA applicant and the CDBGDR grantee and subrecipients. The reasons for this coordination and having these clear points of contact are to really do your planning and your due diligence to make this work for you. The advantage of flexible match when it's, when it's working for you is that you can streamline your uh, overall oversight and uh, reduce your administrative costs by concentrating your CDBG disaster recovery funds into the, um, the smallest number of sites possible for across your projects. And by doing that, you're really going to narrow the focus of um, the use of the CDBGDR funds so that you are only focused on compliance with two sets of programs in that one um, area where you're concentrating your CDBGDR funds. So you're going to look for, um, for example, uh, at, when you're planning at the outset and you're choosing which sites where you're going to uh, invest your CDBGDR. You're going to look for sites that um, where you know it's going to be easy to use CDBGDR to satisfy your local match. You're going to want to decide which specific sites or costs within a project you're going to charge to the CDBG disaster recovery grant. And you really, at the same time, want to maximize um, your, your choices to, as those choices that are going to benefit persons of low and moderate income. And by doing that, you're going to make sure that you're supporting the uh, overall goal of the use of CDBGDR funds, which is the, um, to benefit uh, low and moderate income persons. And so you want to take some time to figure out um, how much CDBGDR is going to be available to use for match projects. And, you know, there, there never seems to be quite enough money to pay for everything that you need as part of your recovery. So your amount of CDBGDR might not be sufficient to cover the full local match requirement for all of your public assistance funds. And if that's the case, you're going to have to pick and choose. Um, your first pass is going to just be at projects that will even comply with CDBGDR requirements at all because they're, you know, they're an eligible activity under the CDBGDR program. And then you want to look for project worksheets that are either fully obligated by FEMA or your actual costs are known and you're doing reimbursement um, because that might reduce the possibility that the scope of work is changing and hopefully will help even further reduce the, the amount of coordination it's going to take as those um, you know, costs and, and changes have to be reviewed both on the PA side and on the CDBGDR side. And really want to think about managing risk of noncompliance. So in most cases, a CDBGDR grantee is going to be um, working with subrecipients who are PA applicants to pass down the um, and subgrant the CDBGDR funds. And, you know, we have to realize that the CDBGDR grantee retains the responsibility for oversight here. And so the CDBGDR grantee is going to have to make some risk-based determinations for, you know, how and when they're going to monitor compliance. Is it going to be at the end or are there going to be some checks along the way? And the more you push that compliance effort to the back end, it's going to increase your risk of noncompliance and your potential for monitoring find, findings. And if you are a CDBGDR grantee and you get monitored by HUD and you haven't done your work for overseeing the, the subrecipient, it's the CDBGDR grantee that ultimately is on the hook for remedying the noncompliance. 
So there's a real need to assess the capacity of subrecipients and then um, determine how much oversight is necessary for um, to, to make sure that you're you're meeting the subrecipient where it is. Uh, but if you if you have to pick and choose because you don't have enough money to pay for your full amount of match, you should look for subrecipients that are high capacity or that have um, demonstrated ability to keep great records or they're operating on a reimbursement basis and they already have great records. And the more you can get information out the door to your potential subrecipients early, even before you know the final amount of your match, you can let them know, you know, here's what you're going to need to be successful in either applying for a subgrant for match funds or, um, or in carrying out a CDBGDR uh, subgrant for match. And so if you're making deliberate choices early on in the grant life cycle, then you can reduce your administrative costs. And part of that is, you know, having your checklist in place and, um, and, and really educating up any subrecipients who are going to be carrying out a piece of the puzzle so that everyone is on board and better able to comply with both the PA and the CDBGDR requirements. So just um, moving here to a, a, a little bit of a discussion on PA projects that are based on actual costs. Um, you know, for 406, when we're, when we're talking about, and, and 403 and 407, any of these projects that are based on actual costs, uh, the amount of local match might be unknown over time, right? It's, um, you're going to start out with an estimate, but since you're operating on a reimbursement basis, those costs are going to be refined over time. And then when your actual costs are known, that's when you're going to be able to determine, oh, my final requirement for local match is X, you know, $100,000, whatever it is. You're going to know that once the actual costs are known. And on the CDBG disaster recovery side, our appropriations acts generally include a statutory order of assistance that prohibits the use of CDBG disaster recovery funds for costs that FEMA is going to pay once they're eventually included in the project um, or in the project worksheet. So for any PA project, um, given that the amount of local match can change over time for any number of reasons, I mean, it can be actual costs are changing, it could be scope of work is changing, or it can be that, you know, you have a situation where all of a sudden the grantee is over a certain threshold of damage and the percent of the required match is changing, um, you know, if the damage estimates are really high. All of those things can cause a problem if you put all of your um, CDBG disaster recovery dollars in and then um, and then the scope decreases and the amount of local uh, match that's required decreases because in those cases, um, you know, you're, you've already paid for something that ultimately you didn't have to pay for that FEMA would pay for and you could potentially end up violating that order of assistance provision. On the other hand, you know, if, you're, if your costs are going up, if there are upward adjustments in actual costs, these aren't going to lead to order of assistance problems because you can always go, go in after the fact and increase the amount of local match over time. So, um, you know, the key takeaway from this conversation is that CDBG disaster recovery funds cannot be used to temporarily pay for um, costs that are later going to be reimbursed by FEMA. So you hear grantees sometimes ask about bridge funds or float funds or can I front the money with my CDBGDR and then get reimbursed later by FEMA? And the answer to that is no. And, and it's a hard no because we can't waive the order of assistance provision since it's in the CDBGDR Appropriations Act itself. Um, we HUD cannot waive that. So, you know, that provision can be violated even if you say, oh, I'm just giving them temporarily and then I'm going to recapture them. If you know FEMA funds are coming or if FEMA funds are coming later, then you can't decide you're going to pay for it up front with CDBGDR and just being reimbursed. So this is why FlexMatch is a key 
um, concept that requires planning in order to be successful. You have to have policies and procedures in place that are going to ensure your compliance with requirements. So, you know, what, what would a successful grantee do to avoid um, violating order of assistance provisions? Uh, there, you know, this is gonna really depend on your specific facts and how fast the funds are flowing in your area, how quickly your projects are coming together. But some key things that we highlight in the guidance are one, waiting until the scope of work on your PA is uh, your PA project is unlikely to change before charging costs to the CDBGDR grant or subaward. You can go ahead and reserve funds, but wait to actually charge the cost to CDBGDR if you can until you know what those costs are going to be. Um, Another option is to just say, we're gonna operate entirely on reimbursement. We're gonna pay for costs with non-federal funds initially, and then we'll reimburse ourselves. And the key there, if you wanna go that route, it's a good route to go. Um, there are some regulations that you need to follow. So for, um, for local government, CDBGDR grantees um, to CFR 200.305, and for states looking at the Treasury State Agreement and the regulations at 31 CFR Part 205. Um, then, you know, the, you can also apply some concepts that often show up in contracts at, like retainage, for example. You can hold back a portion of your CDBGDR funds that are planned for activities to satisfy local match. And then once the projects, you know, are finally shaping up and you know your actual cost, pay that 10% holdback or whatever it is to make sure that you're not violating order of assistance provisions. You're not putting more CDBGDR into the project than is going to be required to pay local match. Um, and then again, all of this is just going to take regular coordination with the point of contact on the PA applicant side um, just to anticipate problems and know when the project is changing and make sure you have a strategy that's considering the requirements of both programs. So, um, you know, there are times when FEMA funds are awarded after the CDBGDR for a project, um, you know, in particular where, you know, FEMA funds just, no one thought they were gonna be available. And, you know, in if that happens and you've already put the, um, CDBGDR into the local match for the PA, then you should immediately recapture those funds once you know that the FEMA assistance is, is on the way. And, you know, there are a few instances where, you know, this might happen years after you've, you've put in the CDBGDR funds. So, you know, uh, one example that come up, uh, that, that's come up in, in recent years, we had a state that had initial PA obligations that were subject to a 75-25 split, the standard 25% um, non-federal cost share. But after four years, the state's costs had increased enough to pass the threshold where FEMA, under its regulations at 44 CFR section 206.47, um, recommended an increase to 90% federal cost share for FEMA PA. And once that happened, all of a sudden there was more FEMA PA coming into the projects. But, you know, for those PA projects that were right at the end of, you know, they were near closeout and they'd already expended funds, you know, that's a situation where, you know, there wasn't, there was no intentional violation of order of assistance, but you still have to go ahead and recapture those funds as quickly as possible to prevent a duplication of benefits. That's that's not really the same as fronting funds, it's just an unknown. But, you know, to the extent that you can anticipate those unknowns, just don't um, pay for the cost with the CDBGDR upfront. It's much better to deal with it on the front end. Um, you know, we've already had a couple of questions about small projects and projects under alternative procedures for 428s. Um, Flexible match works in both of these cases. In some instances, you know, there are some different considerations when you're talking about an estimated scope of work 
and a fixed cost award from FEMA. So match in those cases is usually fixed. It's pretty much based on the estimated cost to complete the scope of work for these projects. And where, you know, where that cost is fixed, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, that's what the match is going to be based on. It's, it's also usually fixed. And there are a few exceptions to that that we can, um, you know, that, that FEMA may handle on a case-by-case -case basis. But for the most part, um, you know, you're, you are going to have uh, situations where FEMA funds, you know, the PA funds might be able to be moved around in the same project worksheet or another 428 project worksheet. But, um, you know, the CDBG funds in most cases will stay the same. Um, when you're talking about moving within the same project worksheet, if you're talking about another project worksheet, um, you know, it might cause the match amount to change and you should go to FEMA for advice on what to do in those cases. Um, you know, the, we wanted to make sure we gave you an example of what this looks like. Um, you know, for, uh, this is a, uh, an example that basically just modifies some of the examples Denise was talking about. So assume in this case we're talking about a Section 428, it's a fixed cost alternative procedures project. And in this case, the actual costs are, are less than the estimated costs. So there are some cost savings for the underruns. And the PA applicant wants to use them for uh, um, uh, approved work on the same project. So in this case, you can see in the first column that the total cost um, for the estimated cost of the project are the same as the earlier example, 1,150,000. And the excess funds you can see in the second column are 70,000. There were cost underruns and that 70,000 was able to be shifted to um, uses, other types of uses for approved work. And those types of uses might include, for example, restoration of disaster damage uh, facilities and equipment, or al alternate projects like purchasing equipment, constructing new facilities, or improvements to undamaged facilities such as um, shelters and emergency operations centers in the declared areas. There are also some mitigation measures you can um, move towards. And, you know, another example might be salaries for your PA or your emergency management staff. Those things are pretty well covered by, um, by FEMA's existing guidance. But, you know, when you are moving those funds around, in this case, where it's on the same project, your amount of your HUD CDBGDR funds is not going to change, and the uses of your HUD CDBGDR funds are not going to change because the amount was based, the amount of the local match was based on the estimated costs so they don't change even if the actual costs differ. And the, the funds don't move around because they were already concentrated in site four in this case. And um, so this is, this is an example where you have, um, you have no movement. If, for example, you wanted to consider something that, um, if, if you wanted to cover not covered by this example, where the PA applicant wants to use funds across other alternative procedure permanent work projects. Um, the effect on local match in those cases is going to require a fact-specific look. So PA applicants really need to coordinate with FEMA to discuss potential implications on required local match if the excess funds are going to be shifted for costs on other projects. And this is important because if the required local match decreases, the CDBG disaster recovery grantee is going to figure out whether this would potentially cause order of assistance problems if the amount of CDBG funds that went into the project um, exceed the ultimate required local match. So another piece that I that I want to touch base on in, in, on this slide, and then I'm going to hand it over to Onye to just do a knowledge check, is um, you know that. Really, the flexible match option, it's going to work in a lot of cases, right? It's going to help where you've got multiple sites. 
it's not really going to help where all of your um, work is happening on one site location, right? The, the cost savings and the advantages of this concept really come into play when your work is spread out over a large geographic area and you're able to identify a clear and limited CDBG disaster recovery assisted portion of that project on a single site that you can distinguish. And the reason for that is that, you know, if you're outside of the match concept, um, you know, when you're just talking about CDBG disaster, uh, CDBG disaster recovery funds or any type of CDBG assistance, that money is, is used with other types of funding sources um, for, for many projects all of the time. But the requirements um, really are going to apply to any part of a, any part of work that's considered a CDBG assisted project. And so the reason the flexible match concept works is that for purposes of CDBG, only the site that the CDBG funds are going into is really, um, you know, for the most part going to be the CDBG assisted project. You need to consider this because, you know, if you are building a building and, you know, you're you're going to put a dollar of CDBG into the building. If it's a construction project and you're building a public facility, you know, Davis-Bacon requirements are going to apply to the whole facility. So that's why you really can't get down to a lower level. And the flexible match concept is really useful when you're talking about multiple sites, but just concentrating and clearly demarking your um, your area that is a CDBG DR assisted project. So I think with that, I will pass it on to Onye um, with one, uh, one final reminder that coordination is imperative here. And um, you, know, you, should, you should be taking precautions to just make sure that as you move forward with any flexible match option, you are never putting in more CDBG DR funds than, um, than you're going to need in your final actual amount of required local match. And with that, Anya, I'm going to pass the ball to you. Thanks, Carrie. So we're going to have a knowledge check. Um, there are two questions here that uh, we would love you guys to go into the polling section of the WebEx and uh, respond to. They're both true and false questions. The first question says, costs that are funded by CDBGDR only need to adhere to CDBGDR requirements. So what is the response to this? Is this true or is it false? And the second question is, FEMA allows flexible match to be used for prior disasters. For CDBGDR, if a project was not included in an action plan, substantial amendment to the action plan must be done. Substantial amendments require additional citizen participation and HUD approval. Is this question true or false? So if we look at the responses for the first question, um, a majority of you, I think, chose, a majority of you guys chose um, false, which is the right answer. So the entire PW must comply with all PA requirements. Um, the sites, facilities, or structures that are part of the CDBGDR system portions of this PW must comply with CDBGDR requirements and PA requirements for the CDBGDR assisted, assisted activities to satisfy the local match requirement. Um, for the second question, I think a, a portion of you guys got this question correct as well. Um, yes, the project will have to have a tie back to the disaster, but not necessarily the damage or the reason for the disaster. Um, and the use of the funds must also meet national objective, provide a benefit to low income persons. And yes, um, if you are making an amendment, um, you, you definitely need to go through the substantial amendment process. So now we're gonna go into talking about grant management and close out. So like Carrie said, um, the use of CDBGDR funds to satisfy a local match will require some planning by both the CDBGDR grantees and subrecipients to avoid violating the order of assistance provisions that apply to CDBGDR funds. CDBGDR grantees um, should make sure that they plan and develop policies and procedures that ensure that they're complying with the order of assistance requirements. 
um, and that they consider their PW amendments and any changes to the local match requirements or any changes to FEMA's obligation on a given project. Um, again, like Carrie said, to avoid issues when it comes to using these funds, you want to wait till the scope of work is developed before charging costs to CDBGDR. You also want to wait until the actual costs are incurred if you can. And throughout the process, whether it's before you get the grant or as you've gotten the grant and you're spending against the grant, and even when you're about to close out and afterwards, you want to always make sure that you're coordinating regularly um, between you know, the CDBGDR, CDBGDR grantees and your FEMA PA applicants. Um, this coordination is going to allow you to you know, anticipate problems and develop a strategy that you know, considers what each grant needs and requires and make sure that you don't um, set yourself up for failure. Ideally, CDBGDR grantees and subrecipients um, would want to be involved in the FEMA PA process when applicants are you know, completing or drafting PWs and submitting, submitting their requests for FEMA approval. And then making sure that as the PA applicant is submitting these requests um, for payment disbursements, that they're involved, that they're, aware, that they're aware of these disbursements and how it affects their own disbursements and how um, these disbursements affect their compliance with the order of assistance or duplication of benefits and any other um, federal requirements, which we'll get into later in the presentation. As you can see in this table here, uh, FEMA and HUD both have requirements um, to review their grantees' performance on a quarterly basis through quarterly performance reports. And both FEMA and HUD also require quarterly submission of the Federal Finance Report, or SF-425. Um, and these things are an opportunity for both um, applicants and grantees to coordinate how they will tell their story on their program process, progress and ability to provide oversight over their local match projects. Um, so now we're going to talk about closeout. One thing to remember is, as you are spending down your federal funds, you want to make sure that you're adhering to your spending timelines and ensuring that as you that you are able to close out the grant on time and with the adequate documentation for any and all future audits that might come up that may be performed. For FEMA PA, the deadline for emergency work, which covers sections 403 and 407, is six months from the declaration date and can be extended by an additional six months. The deadline for permanent work um, is 18 months from the declaration date and can be extended by an additional 30 months. The process for FEMA begins when projects are completed. And to begin to close out, the FEMA PA subrecipient notifies the PA recipients that work is completed and the date when the work was completed. To close a small project, the PA recipient must certify in writing that the PA applicant completed the approved scopes of work. And once FEMA receives the PA recipient's certification, FEMA officially closes the small project. It's a little different for large projects in that the PA subrecipient must provide documentation to support the actual costs within 90 days of work completion. The PA recipient must then verify to FEMA that all costs align with the approved scope of work. The work is in compliance with the FEMA state tribe agreements and all payments comply with 2 CFR Part 200.305. For 428 projects, the PA recipient must submit its certification to FEMA within 180 days of the PA subrecipient completing its last section, 428 alternative procedures project, or the latest alternative procedure project deadline, whichever occurs first. So in order to close the PA grant award to the PA recipient, FEMA and the recipient must conduct a final reconciliation which verifies that FEMA has issued final determinations on all appeals. All eligible PA funding has been obligated. The PA recipient and applicant have completed all program projects and met all the requirements. The recipient has submitted its final expenditure report to FEMA and both FEMA and the recipient have completed all administrative activities related to the PA program. When you talk about CDBGDR, you're gonna see somewhat of the same similarities. All funds must be expended before the end of the period of performance, according to the grantee's grant agreement, such that it's important that the CDBGDER grantee be clear about the timeline for the completion of all work within, in, within its uh, agreements with contractors and subrecipients. For DR, the process begins when the CDBGDR grantee informs HUD of closeout. HUD verifies the data that's reported 
the, in their system, the DRGR system. The grantee then submits its final quarterly performance report. HUD then determines that the grantee is ready to close after its review. The grantee submits its closeout checklist. HUD will review this checklist and flag any issues they may have. And if there is none to flag, HUD and grantee will enter under, under a closeout agreement and HUD will close out the grantee's line of credit um, in their lock system. After closeout, the CDBGDR grantee must ensure continued compliance with the use of CDBGDR funds, ensuring that there's no program income and retaining records in the case of future audit. So this is a lot of information, but I wanna reiterate that again, as we've discussed in the prior slides, you wanna make sure that you're planning and making good decisions um, about how one, the PA applicant is grouping sites in a project worksheet and how the CDBGDR grantee is consolidating this funding within project to be beneficial for closeout. If possible, um, you wanna choose projects where the reconciliation of transactions are not complicated and projects where you do not have to deal with lingering issues that may prevent either grant from successfully closing out, such as audit. And this speaks to the importance of coordination that we talked about heavily in this presentation. Um, again, you, you wanna be coordinate, coordinating at all times, especially during the program, um, making sure that as you're dispersing funds, you're monitoring for anything that could potentially trigger um, issues with compliance. You're monitoring things that might affect DOB. Um, you're ensuring that your contracts are clean. If there are any applicable requirements like Davis Bacon that needs to be followed, that you're following them and documenting um, all your decisions that are being made and any decision that's FEMA, that you know may be happening on the FEMA side is also being communicated on a timely basis to the DR side and vice versa. And just because projects might close out does not mean that coordination ends right then and there. You wanna make sure that coordination is continuously ongoing. So such that you know a project is closed out, you wanna make sure that whatever happens after the fact, there's still that communication, whether there's an audit that may incur um, as the audit's going on, you may want to inform the other partner, hey, here are the findings from the audit that might be applicable to you to be aware of to address any concerns that may affect your grant. Again, coordination is very important. We always want to be diligent in how we're monitoring the program and so forth. With that said, I will pass it on to Michaela to discuss how to satisfy applicable federal requirements. Thank you, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, and, and please just kind of hang in there a little longer as we um, finish up our presentation. Um, and, and hopefully you all can stay on for a few extra minutes just to make sure that we, we get through all of our content that, that we need to share with you guys. Um, so throughout this presentation, my colleagues at HUD and partners with FEMA and ICF have reiterated this concept a flexible match and our joint guidance is really a tool to help you guys streamline the process to maintain compliance with both agency requirements. And our guidance document really acts as a reminder for some of those key topics that are necessary to be thinking about and planning for when you know you want to use the HUD CDBG VR funds for match. Um, and we've hit on this a lot, but that's a really big piece of why continuous coordination is so important. Um, so we'll first start with the procurement requirements and FEMA, please feel free to jump in too during the section to highlight any of those important considerations. Um, so I'll first start with the easier scenario and that is when FEMA applicants and FEMA recipients are local governments or tribes and the HUD grantee is also a local government. Um, this group, this combination, has the same requirements to comply with 2 CFR 200, uh, 318 through 326. So that makes it a little bit easier. Um, states, however, are treated a little differently under each of these programs. So for FEMA's public assistance program, a state must comply with federal procurement procedures at 2 CFR 200, 317, which includes following those same policies and procedures that they would otherwise use for procurement uh, with non-federal funds, um, in addition to complying with those Environmental Protection Agency guidelines at 2 CFR 200-322 for procurement of recovered materials. 
Then for HUD CDBG DR program, our recent Appropriations Act have required the Secretary to certify in advance of making a grant that the CDBG DR grantee has in place proficient procurement processes. So this usually means that a grantee's procurement procedures upholds the principles of full and open competition, evaluates the cost or price of the product or service, and maintains their official website with the information about procurement using CDBG DR funds. A state grantee under CDBG DR has three procurement options to choose from. In the first, a state can adopt to uh, part 200, 317, and impose 318 through 326 on its subrecipients. Its second option is to adopt 318 through 326 for themselves. And then their third option is to follow their own procurement policies and procedures and establish procurement policies and procedures for the CDBG DR subrecipients, as long as they're based on full and open competition, among other requirements. And our federal register notices governing our funds dictate all of these requirements. But in general, when we're talking CDBG DR contracts, we're talking things like uh, periods of performance, performance requirements, and, and liquidated damages. So to address these differences, you want to first look at what's similar between the two programs. And, and that's things like your full and open competition, evaluating cost or price, um, so if you're doing both of those for both programs, this piece is covered. Um, then to address the differences, a state CDBG DR grantee should consider including provisions in their procurement requirements that adopt both HUD and FEMA procurement requirements for activities that will be used to satisfy FEMA's local match. This will eliminate confusion on the front end about which procurement rules apply. This is all about timing, as we've been talking about, and, and typically CDBG DR grantees, when they are preparing their initial action plans, they know that they want to use a portion of their funding for match. Um, but again, as mentioned earlier, if this happens later on, you can follow the amendment process and resubmit certifications to HUD as necessary to reflect those material changes. On the reverse side, a PA applicant is probably procuring goods and services before they know that CDBG DR funds are available for local match. So to address this on their front end, a PA applicant should include a provision in their procurement solicitation documents um, with their contracts that, that the contracts may be amended from time to time to expand the scope of work funded by other federal, federal sources and subject to those applicable requirements. So this will allow contracts to be modified in the future to include terms mandated for CDBG DR assisted contracts. And so for there, we're talking about hiring Section 3 residents, uh, ability to subcontract with Section 3 businesses, comply with Davis-Bacon, or add in the liquidated damage provisions. Um, and so both parties can also do their due diligence when selecting contractors and just remember to document and maintain your records uh, to detail the history of your procurement uh, considerations. Other requirements, um, we'll, we'll be briefly talk through these. They are in greater detail in the guidance. Um, and, and I just want to mention too, that our guidance does not cover all programmatic requirements, but really does try to highlight some of those requirements that you may or may not be thinking about um, when using your CDBG DR funds to satisfy the local match. Um, and, and typically when we're talking these requirements, we're talking things like our Section 3 and our Davis-Bacon. Um, both federal agencies with HUD and FEMA um, apply the URA provisions and have environmental related requirements. And I will note too uh, that HUD does have the authority to adopt other federal agencies' environmental reviews. Um, and so we have guidance out there on the HUD exchange and in applicable notices to help our grantees do this. Some special considerations to be thinking about are things like flood insurance, 
the applicable codes and building standards and elevating and flood proofing and from our CDBG TR grantee perspective, the green building standards. Um, so starting with flood insurance, um, federal funding provided for property in a special flood hazard area does trigger the federal statutory requirement under the National Flood Insurance Reform Act of 1994 to maintain flood insurance on a property in perpetuity. If the property is sold or transferred, the seller or transferrer is required to notify the buyer or the transferee in writing that flood insurance must be obtained and maintained. In general, no federal disaster relief assistance made available in a flood disaster area may be used to make a payment, including loan assistance, to a person for repair, replacement, or restoration for damage to personal, residential, or commercial properties if the person at any time has received federal flood disaster assistance that was conditioned on the person first having obtained and maintained flood insurance and the person has subsequently failed to obtain and maintain that flood insurance as required under applicable law. Um, we'll talk about PA really briefly. So for insurable facilities that do not have flood insurance or inadequate flood insurance, FEMA will reduce the PA funding for eligible project costs by the lesser of the maximum amount of insurance proceeds that could have been received if the facility had been covered by an NFIP standard flood insurance policy for the building and its contents or the value of the building and its contents at the time of the incident. Um, Sarah, did you have anything else you want to add in about flood insurance and PA really quick? Oh, no, not about flood insurance. Um, I think that, that pretty much covers it. So it's, it's um, so what Michaela said is that, that that PA portion is reduced if the applicant has failed to get flood insurance by the amount that would have been available. So I think, Michaela, you covered it well. Um, and I can jump back in at the elevation of flood proofing. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, and so for elevation and flood proofing for FEMA, New structures must be elevated to the base flood elevation or flood proof up to the 500 year elevation if serving as critical functions. But this differs for CDBG DR because our requirements are typically based on the type of structure you're dealing with. Um, and this is often found in the Federal Register Notice per appropriation. Um, so that's where our grantees can go to, to see those differences. Yeah, and so this is Sarah um, Mulligan with FEMA. So on the, on the public assistance side, um, as Michaela was just explaining, as our regulatory requirements um, to elevate to the base flood elevation for the 100-year floodplain and critical actions to the 500-year floodplain, public assistance has recently undergone um, some changes regarding our uh, flood criteria. So, um, and this is this is just for public assistance. I think um, other FEMA programs, uh, I think hazard mitigation has a similar requirement, but it's not for FEMA across the board. Um, FEMA has adopted, our public assistance has adopted as a minimum standard, the um, American Society for Civil Engineers Standard 24. And, and basically what that, that standard lays out, um, and this is in FEMA guidance documents, and it's pretty well articulated there. Uh, so um, more detail can be found that, uh, the American Society for Civil Engineers have um, uh, have different classifications. They have four classifications of building based on the risk that a flood would pose to either the contents of the building or the occupants of the building. And so, um, like a, a regular storage facility might be um, one, but a nursing home would be a four because if, if flooded, it would be very hard to move patients or elderly folks out of um, harm's way in, in an expeditious manner. And so. The standard differs between the classifications of, of building between um, the base flood elevation is kind of the baseline up to um, two feet above the base flood elevation. And so it'll, uh, it sometimes aligns with, with HUD standards and then sometimes a, a little less. So there, um, depending on the classification of building, you would have to evaluate what the HUD standard is versus the, the FEMA standard. I think in a lot of cases, HUD still maintains a, a higher a higher standard than um, FEMA does at, at the moment. But that's just kind of talking about the, the differences between the two. Thanks, Michaela. 
Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and then just one quick reminder, green building standards are applicable um, for new construction and replacement of substantially damaged residential buildings, which may not be applicable under FEMA's PA program. Um, so, so just make sure you're, you know, that's, that's one of the DR requirements you'll want to consider. Um, additionally, we, we have another knowledge check, but let's, let's go ahead and skip the, the polling here since we're, we're out of time. Um, the question is really about what happens when the PA project is already under construction and then um, a CDBG DR grantee realizes that elevation standards of the project does not meet HUD standards. What can you do? And, and really, I just want to emphasize quickly that for costs that are related to meeting the flood hazard requirements that are imposed by HUD or FEMA, um, which are eligible, they can be charged to FEMA's PA grant. CDBG DR funds can be used for costs up to the amount of the local match required by FEMA. And when costs cannot be charged to the FEMA PA grant, CDBG DR funds can be used to pay for costs that are required for compliance with CDBG DR requirements or are otherwise necessary and reasonable, um, including complying with the federal cost principle requirements for that related work that's outside of the project, as long as it's CDBG DR eligible and meets the national objective. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to, to Jen to close us out. Hi folks, um, we are over time. I do wanna clarify one thing um, on the grants management slide that when you're talking about an SF-425, we actually do get this question a lot. Um, grantees, uh, if you don't know, on the HUD side at least, you can submit that through the QPR um, in DRGR. So it's part of your QPR. There's, there's additional questions that were added since I think 2018, maybe that change was made. So it's not a separate document you have to submit. We so just wanted to make sure everyone's clear on the HUD side on the SF-425 and what's required there. Um, Terry or Sarah or Denise, are there any questions that came up that really quickly we just want to mention or any clarifications anyone wants to add since we are over time? Jen, this is Terry. I think you, um, you know, we've, we've answered them all in the chat publicly. So, um, you know, I would just have everybody who has remaining questions send them uh, wherever you direct them to send follow-up. All right, folks. Uh, Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, well, here's some contact information for you on these last slides. Feel free to send emails to these to either the HUD email box or the FEMA PA policy branch um, so that you can get any of your questions that we didn't get to today answered or if something comes up and you're reviewing this webinar later on, um, please feel free to reach out and um, we should just thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Thanks, folks. Before we wrap up, here are two last pieces of information to share. First is the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General hotline, where you can report suspected corruption, waste, fraud, abuse, mismanagement, or misconduct by phone at 1-800-323-8603 or by mail at DHS Office of Inspector General forward slash mail stop 0305 attention hotline 245 Murray Lane Southwest Washington DC 20528-0305. Additionally, FEMA has procurement guidance available at the FEMA website at www.fema.gov forward slash grants forward slash procurement where you can learn about FEMA's procurement disaster assistance teams and about procurement guidance for recipients and subrecipients under 2 CFR Part 200, the Uniform Rules. Here's that contact information again for this webinar. Thanks so much.